So, uh, I'm the program manager for Task Platform, so I kind of just generally geek around kind of linked agent RDF as we live in. Um, I'm not going to do a technical talk, uh, and I'm probably going to pick up on some themes that I covered in my last Bathcam talk. Um, but what I wanted to do was talk about what I've been calling web integrated data. Because right? I knew there's quite a few people in the audience who are still on the fence. And I really want to push you off in the right direction. Right? <laughs> so um, what I want to do is kind of talk, talk through about um, data. We've got lots of different kinds of data people are talking about. Right? Microdata, big data, open data, linked data, linked open data. But what I think we're all really more interested in is useful data. Right? It's stuff that we can actually work with and do something awesome with. Um, and I, my thesis is that we can maximize the utility of data by integrating it with the web as deeply as possible. And so that's what I want to take through in this presentation. I want to talk about how we can put data on the web, how we can integrate it with the web, and how we can try and maximize that utility. And hopefully, that maybe convince some of you that linked data is at least worth revisiting um, if you're still kind of on the cusp. So there's, to my mind, there are three stages of web integration of, of putting data online. So let's go through those, those, those different stages. These, are, uh, these aren't mutually exclusive. Um, they uh, uh, all have their own kind of benefits. Um, and so, but I just kind of want to take you through as a kind of, a kind of uh, rhetorical kind of argument of, of how each stage kind of builds on uh, the one before it. So first stage, you just want to put some data on, on the web. Right? You've got something, you've got some spreadsheets, you've got some PDFs, you've got some database dumps. You just need to get it online. You just want to put that raw data online and let people do something with it. Just get it onto a web server so somebody can download it and just work with it. Right? That's the very first stage. It's the real kind of entry level stuff, but it's actually quite a big step for lots of organizations, right? Because they've actually got to think about, well, what is it that we've got that people might be interested in? What is it that we've got that we want to let people see and that we feel comfortable in accessing? And actually, it, this, the, that first question isn't really a technical one at all. It's more of a kind of cultural one that organizations have to kind of think about how uh, they want to start to be more open and how they want to share content on the web. So you put it online, and then you want people to be able to find it, so you kind of have to organize it in some way, so perhaps you build a little data set directory, there's lots of places doing that now, you know, so there's, there's one, there's data set directories for San Francisco, you can get one for London, there's all kinds of organizations putting up kind of web pages that let you download data in all kinds of different formats, all right, so this is the kind of, so the first <coughs> one. And of course, as we've just been hearing, you've got to license it. You've got to make sure that you're, you're licensing it in a way that the reuse is kind of allowed and the context of that reuse is clearly articulated. If you don't want commercial usage, then you should say that. If you want attribution, then you should say that too. Um, I'm not going to kind of could do a whole talk on that issue alone because it's, as you, Toby's already said, it's a really important thing. But, but licensing is something that, that really needs to be in that first step, the first thing you consider. Right, so you've done that, you can sit back, you can crown yourselves the kings and queens of, 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 of open data and just wait for really great things to happen, for people to download it and do something with it. Great, that's level one, okay? So let's see if we can level up and go to the next stage. Move to what I'll call web accessible data, right? So this is kind of a bit more integrated with the web infrastructure, web architecture. So what we want to do is instead of just putting up a pile of kind of database dumps or spreadsheets or PDFs, we want to switch to using open formats, um, standard formats that people can use without having to use any kind of proprietary software to interpret it. So things like you know, CSV or uh, XML or JSON or just something that's more kind of friendly to work with and it's, it's kind of more adapted for working with on the web, right? So somebody can use, use it in a JavaScript library in a browser and they don't have to necessarily download it and import it into a database before they can do something Then you might want to think about adding web API, right? So there's a there's all that there is a set of people, and there will always be a set of people that just want to kind of accumulate data. They like to download it, and they want to crunch on it locally, and just you know have it on their hard drive, right? Yeah. To me, it's kind of uh, where we are now with kind of open data is very similar to where we were, kind of uh, I guess in the kind of mid 90s, where we all want an align, and we downloaded everything we could get 
you know, all the sound clips and, and images and things because we thought it would probably all go away in a few weeks, right? So that's the situation. I think lots of people are in with, with data. Um, there are some valid uses for why you'd want to take <coughs> copies for stuff, right? Because you might want to do some big complicated crunching, which requires some, uh, you know, some uh, serious hardware behind it. But actually, in a lot of cases, you just need a web API. So the, um, you don't want to force the consumer to have to import things into a database or build their own infrastructure around something. They just want quick, real-time, easy access to get a little piece of data to kind of mash up or put into their application. So going that extra mile as a data publisher, and putting some more effort into providing a bit more infrastructure for them, can unlock a bit more kind of usefulness in that data. Right? You've got to think about a whole new set of issues then, because you've got to think about, well actually I'm not just putting files on a web server anymore, I'm building a service, and how am I going to make sure that service can scale, if it's really, if it becomes popular, um, you know, are there, um, well, there's a whole, all kinds of kind of sustainability issues around providing an API, but I think it's pretty clear that APIs are really important, they, they hit uh, a nice sweet spot for many um, uses of, of open data. Right, so that's, that's level two. Let's go to level three. All right. I'm moving quite fast for this. <coughs> so next step for me is web addressable data. All right. So let's kind of take a bit, fur bit further. It's not just stuff that's on the web and is amenable for processing on the web. It's something that's more deeply integrated. All right. So it's stuff that I can link to, and that's the important thing. So what we start to do is not just let somebody link to a document or link to a piece of data uh, as an API request, what we want to do is to actually start to assign identifiers to the things that are in the data set. So the people, the places, the locations, the bus stops, all, the, all these things that are in the data set, they need an identifier. Um, and on the web, we give things identifiers by giving them web addresses. We use HTTP for that. So we can start to tease apart our data set and assign identifiers, web, web identifiers to all of those different things. And that's got the nice property that we can do um, much more with them. Right? I, can, I can give you a link for that in an email and you can click on it and you can look at it in your browser. Right? So you no longer have to actually write some code to get that piece of data, you can just look at it in the browser and it's possible to, to, to make that URL respond with a HTML page if somebody accesses it in a browser or as a piece of XML or JSON if they, you call it from a script. So we can start to actually uh, unlock a little bit more usefulness from the data because we can let non-programmers start to look at data too. Right? So we can, it's not just about empowering people to do mashups. What about the ordinary people, right? because um, programmers aren't ordinary people, um, <laughs> that just want to kind of look at a data set and navigate around in it. Right? If we start to make things linkable on the web, then we can start to empower a, a whole new audience. Clearly, if you put something on the web, you don't just want to have dead ends, you want to link things together as well. Because then somebody, given, a, given a, a, an identifier for something in the data set, can then navigate through the data set and explore something that's interesting to them. It kind of comes back to what Livy was saying earlier about providing interesting pathways through data. But you don't always have to program those, you can just let somebody find their own way through the data, they find some data, data point that's of interest and then they can mail it to somebody. Right, that's very different to, to kind of putting up an API or putting a file for download on the web. Okay, so we've kind of got that far, kind of halfway through stage three now, and we can sit back and we can think, okay, we can make even more cool, amazing, awesome things to happen. But there's a little bit more we can do before we kind of really get to level three. Right? We don't just want to put the data on the web, what we can also do is put the data model on the web as well. And so Chris has already kind of, um, uh, I think, did a good talk to kind of talk around some of the issues of understanding a data model and how you kind of have to interpret that. Um, so if we can go a little bit further and start to actually put, uh, treat our data model like our data, so we can put that online for people to look at and explore, then that can unlock an extra, uh, can unlock more kind of utility from the data set. Right. So. You might not think that's very useful. So let me give you an example. So this is a, this is a spreadsheet that comes from the OECD. Right? This is um, 
OECD in figures 2008 and its domestic and foreign finance. I'm not sure whether you can read this or not, but um, it's a fair, I think a fairly typical example of um, data. This is kind of, it's not probably openly licensed, but anybody can come and download that and use that now. Um, but it's really complicated. And there's lots of terms in here that I've been foggiest what they are. Net income before provisions, no. Broad money, to me it sounds something like maybe from the 30s. Um, there's a kind of her SDR, I don't know what that is. The most I could do is cut and paste some of those terms out, I could put them <coughs> in the browser, and I could search them, and I might be able to find some useful definition. I've, I've reached a dead end in that none of these things are linked. So I can't just click on <coughs> broad money and work out what that is. Right? But if, if this was in a, put online in a machine readable way, with the data model online as well, then I could link through to the definition and I can understand what it is. Um, just setting aside the kind of complicated structure here, the important thing, the important thing to point out, and Chris already mentioned this, is all these, these little numbers and notes that are next to these different values. So we've got number two here, and nearly all of the countries are qualified in some way. And I think elsewhere in the spreadsheet, some of the individual figures are as well. It's because real world data is really messy. And um, you can't just abstract away that messiness. Whenever you start to summarize any data, you need to include some kind of qualifiers. You've got to be able to annotate individual data items, individual fields in the data, to make sure that people can understand um, what it means and whether the different values are actually, can actually be legally compared with one another. So we need, um, we need to not just put the data up or the data model, we also need to be able to address these ind every individual value or, or combination of value. We need an identifier for those because if we have, then we can attach some data to it and we can we can describe that um, that qualification. So, if we're going to um, put our data model on the web, then we need to identify properties of things, not just the things, and we do that by giving them URLs as well. Right? So we can use just use the web infrastructure. So the problem we've got now is that, okay, we've got this really complicated structure and we know that we need a machine readable way to encode that structure. You certainly can't do it in CSV and include all of the, the annotations as well. So what we need is some kind of format or way to represent this, the data and the data model so it can be tied together. And there is only one way, one technical approach at the moment that supports that, and that's RDF. I could, I could approximate it with JSON, I could approximate it with XML, but I would have to write a whole bunch of extra standards and try to get those adopted across uh, very broad sec sections of the internet community in order to achieve the same thing that I can do with RDF. In RDF, data model and data, they're the same thing. It all works on the same underlying principle. Right? RDF pairs everything down into uh, a triple subject, predicate, and object. So what's the thing that I'm making some publishing some data about, what's the relationship that, that I'm um, interested in, and what's the value of that relationship. It can be either a simple uh, label or number, or a relationship to something else. You can take any data in the world, you can pare it down to that simple model, and rebuild it up as a kind of graph structure in RDF. Very difficult to achieve that same thing with um, XML or JSON. And, and so, for me, RDF is a web-native data model. It's, it's kind of got the web designed in. If you want to assign, a, RDF requires you to assign identifiers to the things that you're describing in RDF. You have to do it. And the best practice way to do that is to use web identifiers. In RDF, you have to assign identifiers, global identifiers, to the properties of your things as well. And again, the best practice way to do that is to use web identifiers. So the web's kind of really baked into the model. Um, it's not kind of an optional thing that you might do later to kind of improve interoperability. It's there right from the start. Now that's challenging for a lot of people because it forces you to start to think about issues, quite uh, those kind of issues, how you're going to publish and share and reuse data quite early on in your modeling process. But it's something that you will end up having to do anyway. And so really for me, it just kind of makes the, these the issues more explicit Get you thinking about them. I encourage you to I encourage you to adopt some best practices to make that stuff work. 
I know RDF is a data model, right? And there are many ways to exchange RDF data. So what I mean is there's many ways to kind of take a graph structure, take set triples RDF and write them down in a particular data format. So if you don't like RDF XML because it's verbose, use RDF JSON because you can use it from JavaScript. If you don't want to use either of those, then you could use RDFA and just embed your triples within a HTML page. There's a number of different formats, all of them optimized for different purposes. So XML for um, interoperability and interchange, JSON for use on the web, RDFA if you don't really want to kind of do anything other than just tweak your existing templates. Um, there's Turtle, which is a kind of human readable syntax. There's Ntriples, which is the equivalent of CSV for, for RDF. Because RDF is defined as a data model, you can take that data model and define any number of different ways to actually write it, write it down. And no matter what syntax you're using, you can always go back to that standard data model. So um, there's lots of different options for manipulating it. And I think lots of people get um, caught up on equating RDF and RDF XML. It's not a great format, but then it's some of the design trade-offs are because there's lots of different ways you could write down a graph. Right? It's just a difficult thing to do. Um, you could create more tailored um, XML serialization for RDF if that's what you want to do. And I have done for some projects. So what's linked data? Well, linked data is level three. Right? Linked data is about assigning URLs to things, assigning URLs to properties of things, and putting that on the web so that when somebody puts that um, URL in the browser or fetches that URL using a the script, then they get back something useful. It's about building a web data that's for people and machines. And so it's trying to service a much broader community than just downloading files or just putting up <coughs> a web API. Um, and for me, it's um, going to describe these in kind of stages. And you might quite reasonably be thinking, well, if I just get to stage one, have I, have I actually unlocked you know, 80 or 90% of the value, and the rest is kind of just kind of icing on, on top? But I don't think that's the case. I think at every level, you actually unlock much more value than on the previous ones. The reason being is that because RDF is a, is a graph, it's a network model, and because RDF can be linked together across the web, then we get network effects. Right, because it, it's a kind of network data. And if we get network effects, then we start to be able to get more out of the combined system than we actually put into it. So you can see those network effects. This, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen this kind of linked data diagram kind of ad nauseum. Um, I put it up just to kind of, for two reasons, to show two different kinds of network effects on it. The first is that you can see that there are uh, places like DBpedia, which are um, become hubs in that network. So you can see that there's kind of uh, convergence on standard identifiers for things. You can see that there's um, common, these are different subject areas, they're using the same color schemes. Those are convergence on, on using the, the same terms, the same identifiers for properties of things. Um, which is really nice because it means that um, not only we're we sharing data, but we're also starting to share um, modeling experience. Data modeling is hard. If I can put my data model on the web so somebody else can pick it up and reuse it because they have to be publishing data in the same domain or a related domain, then that helps them open up their data. So that the more data that's put online and the more data models are put online, the lower that barrier to entry gets. And that's, um, you don't get that if you're just putting up files for download or just putting up an API. Because if you put up a new API, you've still got that case that somebody has to implement a new client for your particular system, your particular model. Uh, just a, a quick example of this kind of convergence in action. So the New York Times have published some linked data. They've put up um, some data from their um, kind of uh, their thesaurus, their kind of classification of kind of people and, and places that they use to organise their um, content. So you can go to their go to their um, you go to data.newyorktimes.com and you can see that they've got some human readable views of this data. Uh, this is a description of Frank Zappa, which is, um, uh, whenever I see an A to Z list, I always go to Z. I always go to the letter less traveled. Um, just to see, so it just happened to be the end of the list. So they've got information like you know, how many articles is mentioned in, um, kind of 
topic pages, and they've also linked it through to DBpedia and also Freebase. So they've kind of said that they, these guys are using different identifiers but we're talking about the same thing. So I looked at that and then I looked at BBC Music and they have a page about Frank Zappa and I can get some RDF from that page as well. So they've got their own identifier for Frank Zappa. And I thought, okay, cool mashup idea. Let's mash up the New York Times with BBC Music and see what we can build around that. But I didn't have to do it. The mashup had already been done. The, the New York Times had linked their data to DBpedia. BBC Music had linked their data to DBpedia. So there was no there's no need for me to link New York Times to BBC because there was already a connection between them. There's a service called sameas.org which goes through a whole bunch of different um, uh, linked data repositories and extracts equivalence links, same as links, between different, different, basically different themes in different data sets. So it's kind of a, a special, I could describe it as a specialized search engine, but it's actually just one guy who's kind of downloading stuff and learning into his system. Um, but because we've got much richer uh, relationships between things on the linked data web than we have on the web document, where we've just got a tags, then we can create more specialized kind of search indexes. So this is one for just to look for equivalences between different sites. So I stuck in the URL for Frank Zappa from the New York Times and I got all of these identifiers out of it. So these are all pointers to other places on the web where I can go and get more information about Frank Zappa. Now at the New York Times site, I can get the data in HTML, I can get it in RDF, XML, and I can also get it in JSON. Um, if I can get do pretty much the same thing on BBC site, I go to sameas.org and I can get this in JSON as well. So I can take advantage of all this kind of interconnection between these different um, RDF data sets, but I don't have to use RDF XML. In fact, I don't even have to use an RDF database. I can just make some uh, API calls and take advantage of this network of data. And that's got to be a good thing because it means that, the, again, we've seen this network effect that everybody is starting to benefit from these different interconnections. The, the BBC don't have to connect to everybody that puts up data about Frank Zappa, neither do the New York Times. They can just both link to one data set like DBpedia and the whole kind of starts to just form up as a series of links. So, quick review, so see if I'm going faster. Um, there are different styles of data publishing, each have got their own uh, advantages. To me, deeper web integration increases utility. Every time we try and go to the next level and, 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 and integrate more closely with web architecture, then we get more out of the, our data, not just individually, but we let everybody get more out of our data as well. Because we can generate these network effects between different sources. Um, and for me, the maximum way to get data, utility out of data on the web is to use linked data, is to, use, is to follow those, those principles um, to use RDF as a way to start to share and organize data. So the only way it's going to happen if we all start to adopt it. So let's make some great things happen. So that's it for me.